I see we have some students starting to join us here. So I just want to say thank you for joining this webinar. Um, promises to be an exciting one. I think the topic is really interesting. Um, we have our professor, one of our professors from our School of Management, Subimal Chatterjee, on here uh, to give the presentation. So we'll wait a couple more minutes as students continue to come on and then we'll get started shortly. While we're waiting for some more uh, students to join us, I see the, the students who are on at the moment. I will do a little bit of housekeeping. We will not be attending the chat. We've turned that function off, but you may feel free to ask any questions that you have into our Q&A at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, majority of the questions we will be answering at the end of the presentation. So once um, Professor Chatterjee is done with his talk, we'll give a chance for students to ask questions about SOM, um, questions about the topic in particular, and um, we can go from there. So we'll just wait a couple more minutes until uh, a few more students have logged on, and then I'll let Professor Chatterjee start talking about um, the School of Management after that. While our students are joining us, we know that a lot of you are admitted students who are recently admitted either into Binghamton University or into our School of Management. So we just want to say congratulations on that. And um, we're excited to be able to share this with you and to have some of our faculty be able to present to you and um, share what they have to say about their School of Management. So um, with that, I guess we'll, we'll start. And uh, Professor Chatterjee, you can uh, take it away and just give us a little bit of an overview about the School of Management before we go into the talk. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, before I begin, uh, let me just say something. Uh, these we know are challenging times. And I'm sure that many of you have friends, relatives and loved ones who may be voluntarily putting themselves in harm's way to protect others, or they may have been affected by this scourge that is facing us. Uh, my best wishes, our best wishes go out to you and goes out to all of them. I'm a professor of marketing and I specialize in consumer behavior. Now marketing as a discipline is closest to the consumer and we need to know how consumers will react to our products and services, our messages, what price should be set to them, how best to reach them through TV advertising, social media advertising, physical stores, online delivery, you name it. However, marketing is just one part of SOM. And let me talk a little bit about the school today. The school is made up of three areas. A leadership and consulting is one, finance and accounting is the other, and business analytics is the third group. And marketing along with operations and information systems, we form part of the analytics group. So what is the common theme in a management education? So whether you're in leadership and consulting, whether you're in finance and accounting, or whether you're in business analytics, marketing operations and MIS, what we teach you is how to take risks. So in leadership, the risk goes like this. Should I risk the fortunes of my company in a 35 year old who is a technical whiz, but may not have the experience or should we take our chances with a 70 year old who does not know the technology, but has lots and lots of experience. In finance, what's the risk? Well, should I go all into this initial public offering of Facebook, $38 a share, not knowing 
what the future of Facebook is going to be. And mind you, this I'm talking about when Facebook first started its IPO. In marketing, my favorite area, we are going to remake Top Gun. Well, the first Top Gun came out in 1986, more than 30, 30, 40 years ago before you were born. So will people gravitate towards Tom Cruise and aging Tom Cruise playing Maverick? What kind of risks are we taking? So the common thing that we try to teach you in the School of Management in any area that you're in is how to take good risks and you are rewarded for taking risks, the right sort of risks actually. So what I'm going to do today in my presentation when I talk about crazy choices or irrational choices is try to focus you on one area of risk and that is understanding what are the costs if we fail and what are the benefits if we succeed. Okay, and so what I'm going to show you and it's a part of my research that I hope I get, you know, a little more time to talk about later is when we try to see how consumers figure out the costs and benefits of their decision, sometimes they behave quite crazily or quite irrationally. So Carrie, let's move on to our presentation. And so here we have the first slide on how we choose. Well, how we choose sometimes borders around the crazy, but the craziness comes around how we assess the costs and how we assess the benefits. Now I call it crazy, the more learned economists call it irrationality. And my research interest is that this so-called irrationality is actually the new normal. And therefore we should be in a position to actually predict it. So crazy behavior is actually not that crazy. So if you look at this slide in the next slide, uh, what we are going to see is an interesting problem. And this is a real problem where a daycare center in Israel is facing a problem. The problem went like this. Parents were simply not coming in time to pick up their children. Now mind you, that puts a very big cost on the daycare because they can't send their employees home. Someone has to be with that child till the father or the mother comes to pick him or her up. And so fed up with this problem, one fine day, they decided that they're going to impose a fine. Now imposing a fine is a very rational decision. Why? Because fines or punishment are designed to deter bad behavior. For example, remember those infamous timeouts? Go stand in the corner or sit in the corner. Those were punishments. And so the punishment was this. We are going to fine you about four dollars every time you are more than 10 minutes less late. Okay, now I want you to think about this problem and then answer this question. So on the next slide, let's do the first poll. What do you think happened? Parents were no longer late or, and it happened immediately, or parents started coming in on time and over seven weeks, they have 100% attendance or parents delayed even more to pick up their children. And so much so that the daycare center actually did away with the fine. So what do you think happened? I'm gonna just jump in here, chat and mention to our students, oh, I see them coming in now. Um, so I'm gonna stop the result and I'm gonna share it with our students. Can you see that as well, chat? All right, yes, here we go. So, well, parents were no longer late, that's 0%, I'm, I'm happy, okay? 
parents started coming on time over the next seven weeks and the on time rate became almost 100%, 67%. And uh, about one third of you have said that parents delayed even more to pick up their children. Well, guess what? It's that last answer. Now think about what happened. So why didn't punishment work? Why did punishment not deter bad behavior, but what it did was it encouraged bad behavior? And it goes like this. See, previously when parents would be late, they would feel bad about being late and they would try to come on time. But now once you've instituted the fine, people or parents took that as a license to indulge in bad behavior. After all, they were paying the fine. So why bother trying to hurry and, and come on time? And that's exactly what happened. So the challenge for us is, could we have predicted it and could we have done something else? Of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. Later on, we will see that what the daycare center in Israel did was instead of depending on monetary fines, they went to things like social embarrassments and so on. But let me quickly move to the next example. So in, in one case, the punishment didn't work. But then let's look at incentives. Do incentives work? Well, let's look at the Swedish hospital that's trying to, you know, offer incentives to blood donors. And so now they're offering $7 with the hope that the $7 will compensate the average taxi ride. Now you think incentives work, but then what happened is this incentive not only failed to spur blood donations, but it dropped the level of donation by almost 50%, especially among women. Aha. Uh -huh. So here's the issue. The issue is that we shouldn't try to put dollar values on everything because we have to understand that there are two motivations that work on human beings. One is of course money, you know, punishing them by finding them or giving them money as in this case and motivating them. The other is social. So what are their social motives? All right. In this case, people gave blood to feel good about themselves. And the moment you put a dollar sign, that kind of just spoiled the picture. So Carrie, let's go over to the next question. And this is kind of more along the lines of marketing. And this is the type of research that I do all the time. So in this case, it's a simple choice. Whether you want a one cent, a one cent small Hershey or you, you prefer a 26 cent Rocha, which is, of course, you can look at the picture. It's, it's a larger chocolate. And let's go over to example 2B, the, the second one, Carrie. And here notice that Hershey's is now free and Rocha is 25 cents. Okay, let me pause for a while and let's run the poll and see what happens. How do you choose in the first case between a one cent Hershey and a 26 cent Rocher, and in the second case between a 25 cent Rocher and a free Hershey. So let's, let's give you a couple of, a little bit of time to think about these questions. So give me a shot, give me a best shot. Tell me what do you think, what would you do? What would you do? Okay, so, oh, wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. The results that I see is in the first case, well, no one actually picked Hershey's. 100% went to Rosha. Good for you. But the moment Hershey's was offered free, now I just see a flip. 100% if you go to Hershey and actually none of you go to Rosha. You know why this is so fascinating? Because an economist will look at this and say, this is crazy. And why is this crazy? 
because these two scenarios are exactly identical. How so? Think about this. In the first case, the difference between Roche's price and Hershey's price, 26 cents minus one cent, was 25. In the second case, the difference between Roche's price and Hershey's price is 25 minus zero, still 25 cents. Okay, so why is it that 26 minus one is not equal to 25 minus zero? After all, when we are looking at costs benefits, we are asking ourselves this simple question. Well, if I prefer Rocher to Hershey's, then of course the price I'm willing to pay is the difference of the two costs, 25 cents minus zero or 26 cents minus one. So what happens? Or what happened? Well, Hershey's became free. So now is free a good thing? Well, in this case, yes, as you just said, 100% of you switched to the free Hershey. But let's see on the next slide, Carrie, and see something really nice. What's happening in the next slide? Is free always attractive? <laughs> well, marketers have known all the time. Maybe or maybe not. So here you go. Luxury hugs at $5 and everyone is lining up for the luxury hugs. And when this, when this poor, poor, poor guy with free hugs, nobody. So in this case, free is bad. Now, of course, why is this? And if you ever come into my class in marketing, I will talk about, you know, uh, price as a signal of quality. So something free, people might say, well, there must be something wrong with this person. Why is this person offering free hugs? Of course, now remember, uh, this is an example long before our COVID-19 scare. So uh, no one is going to offer hugs anymore, but, but just work with me on this example, okay? And so this is an example of price as a signal of quality. So when something is free, it can't be good. However, when something has a price tag, then probably that price uh, is a signal of quality. So you see where I'm getting at in marketing. And this is the reason why I love this discipline so much. We don't have a right or wrong answer because, well, because consumers are crazy. What can I say? So, uh, Carrie, let's go over to the last, uh, the, the last example. Expensive shoes. So, put yourself in this in this situation. You buy a very expensive pair of shoes, but after trying them, you find they hurt your feet too much. So, what do you do? You throw them away immediately. You keep wearing them and ignore the pain, or you try one or two more times and then throw them away, or four, stop wearing them but keep them in your shoe cabinet. So there are four options, okay? <laughs> Take a while and what would you do? Remember, there are no right or wrong answers. In marketing and consumer behavior, there can never be right or wrong answers. It's what you think is right or what you think is wrong. And I, as a marketer, will try or will have to anticipate that. Stop wearing them, but keep them in your shoe cabinet. Fantastic, 100% correct. And that's exactly what you do. But uh, the economist will, will look at this and say, wow, this makes no sense. If you're not going to use them, why keep them? Throw them away, make space for some, something else. So do you see this, the, the craziness or irrationality of, 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 of this? But why do people do this? Of course, it makes a lot of sense. Why? Because among the many theories, the one on mental accounting is my favorite. And which says that, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you purchase the shoes, you automatically created a mental account in your head. And an account has the cost on one side and the benefits of the other. Well, it cost you a lot of money. But what about the benefits? You never got to wear them. And when you never got, got to wear them, what happens? There's nothing in your benefits column. So that's the reason you keep them because you can't close that mental account. See, if you toss those shoes, it means that you've closed the mental account. And people are loath to as we say, close the mental account of a transaction in the red. 
The red means the costs are more than the benefits. So the shoes languish in the corner of your shoe box, shoe closet, wherever you keep it, for years until one day you throw them away. And so this notion of closing and not closing mental accounting has lots and lots of implications in marketing. And I will close with one example. So Carrie, if I could go to the last slides here. Long shots, betting on long shots. Okay, so what are long shots? Well, you, in, the, in the case of this Kentucky Derby, the long shot is a horse that has a very little chance of winning, but boy, oh boy, if it wins, you win a lot of money. So would you want to bet on long shots? Sure, why not? Why not? It's, it's after all taking a risk. Yeah, the probability of winning is very little, but the, on the other side, if the long shot wins, I'm gonna make a lot of money. So there's nothing crazy about betting on long shots. But what is crazy about betting on long shots is what we see in racetracks is that the bets on long shots increase towards the end of the day when that racetrack is about to close. So think about it, think about it. The whole day people are around, they don't bet on long shots. But as the course is beginning to close, the last race maybe, you start betting on long shots. It's the same thing about shoes, but we don't see it. How is it the same thing? It's a mental account. When you entered the racetrack, you opened a mental account for that day. Wins and losses. Probably you won, probably you lost. And here's the problem. At the end of the day, it's not like your shoes. You can't save the day. You have to leave the course, which means what? Your account is going to be closed for you, whether you like it or not. And it's in the red because you've lost more than you won. How do you make that up in one swoop? By betting on a long shot. All right, so if you're lucky, then that one bet will cover all your losses and you'll end up in the black. So you see, shoes and horses, they are all the same. We live in this crazy world. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you for listening, everybody. And now we can have some questions if you, if you want. Thank you so much, Professor Chat. Um, so I'm gonna stop this sharing and um, feel free to ask us any questions here. I know we had um, some questions that came in beforehand. So uh, maybe uh, Professor Chatterjee, if you don't mind sharing with us a little bit about how you got into this marketing research in the first place and um, how this kind of you know, drove you to come to Binghamton and kind of what your story was there. Oh, thank you, thank you, yes. Uh... Again, it, it, was, it was a crazy thing. And, uh, you know, you can never plan for these. You can never plan what happens in your life, no matter how much you try. And it happened this way. I was a doctoral student at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, as you can see, the terrible towel over my right shoulder, go Steelers. Uh, and the first three years, I was just wandering the corridors, not knowing what I would do, sitting in classes and getting really scared because I, I couldn't figure out what to do with my life. And then one of my professors, who became a very, very lifelong friend, actually, he became my lifelong friend, suggested that, you know, wh why don't I go over to Carnegie Mellon and take a class? And now Carnegie Mellon and Pitt, they're just a couple of blocks away. And so I went in there and took a class by accident with a person called Professor George Lowenstein. He used to teach irrational choices. First day in that class, I knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's an accident. You can never, never plan for these things. It's something he opened my eyes to these kinds of irrationality and straight away I knew that's what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life. Marketing was just an afterthought after that because I said, well, if I'm going to study crazy choices and crazy consumers, uh, who's going to pay me for doing that? Well, marketing, 
and being a marketing professor, because as you know, as I said in my introductory, uh, uh, in, in, introductory uh, piece, uh, marketing is the discipline where, where it deals directly with consumers. So I found a home in marketing, became a marketing professor, uh, wrote uh, quite a lot of papers on the craziness and uh, that example that I that I gave on Top Gun, uh, some of my best papers have actually looked at uh, the movie industry. And so that's how I, I got here, Carrie. I wish I could say it was all planned and thought out, but nothing in life is. Nothing in life is thought and planned out. Maybe yours was a crazy choice as well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Every, and it, to the folks out there, uh, don't be afraid. It, that was essentially, you know, I forgot I had a slide, <laughs> my last slide that I completely forgot about. That's a fork in the road. Okay, when you come to a fork in the road, you take it. Okay, but don't, don't, don't think. And so what I wish happens to each and every one of you is that when you come to the School of Management, you find something that you love. And if you love something, you'll be very, very good at it. Thank you, Chad. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the career choices that students, your own students have made after, you know, participating in the marketing program at Binghamton or, or other career paths that uh, students have chosen from the School of Management after they've graduated as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, let, me, uh, let me answer the first uh, question. Uh, before the second, um, my my students uh, in, in the marketing arena, uh, pretty much the kind of career paths uh, that they have chosen: uh, sales, advertising, and promotion as brand managers. So there are lots of lots of career paths uh, paths in marketing, but it's all about getting as close to the consumer as possible, and trying to figure out what 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 he or she, what he or she uh, she wants. I, I do have to caution the new group that's coming in. Uh, the marketing area has grown uh, very quantitative and analytics based. That's why we are part of the uh, analytics uh, group. In the, in, in the School of Management because uh, we have lots and lots of consumer behavior data and what managers are trying to look at is can we look at the data and try to make some predictions about uh, consumer behavior. Crazy predictions uh, but nevertheless predictions per se. Uh, now, now switching over to, to other areas, uh, uh, accounting, uh, finance, uh, we have uh, leadership, uh, we have uh, supply chain, so a lot of areas to choose from, uh, different career paths. Uh, we have a very, very good career development center uh, in the School of Management where you can talk to our graduates and they will be able to tell you, you know, what they have done because, you know, we can talk about this and you can read about this, but can you feel it? Can't feel it unless you've done it. So there's, you have to take a risk. You have to choose. Take the risk on something uh, that, that, you, that you love, but how do you fall in love? You'll probably fall in love in one or two of the courses. And then we'll teach you something. You will say, man, that is really, really cool. And that's when, you know, you, you'll, 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 be, you'll be successful. Okay, but again, uh, my, a suggestion, my advice to you of this is that try to be as broad as possible because in the new marketplace, uh, the boundaries are crumbling, okay? And nowadays, for example, and many of you are thinking of maybe uh, I'll have, uh, okay, I'll focus on management information systems, MIS. Nowadays, it's almost indistinguishable from computer science. That's how quickly the world is moving and that's how quickly these so-called silos or these rigid functions are breaking down. So the School of Management is an outstanding place for you to get a variety of tools and techniques and theories under your belt. And what students have done uh, is uh, 
sometimes they double major, sometimes they triple major. So for example, uh, marketing and MIS is a very popular combination. Marketing and leadership, very popular. Marketing and supply chain, uh, very, very, very popular. But it's all uh, with the intention of getting yourself as broadly marketable as possible. So that's the suggestion I, I, I would get. Don't pin yourself down to one area. Thank you, Chat. And we do have time for maybe a couple of more questions. If any students uh, would like to submit their questions in that Q&A box, they can feel free to do so. But um, as we're wrapping up here, Chat, could you give us uh, just your thoughts about what makes Binghamton and Binghamton's um, School of Management, Binghamton's programs, opportunities, internships, what makes that all different from you know, other management schools or you know, other, other choices that students could possibly make? That's a, that's a very good question. Of course, my answer would be very, very biased, but <laughs> let, me, uh, let, me, let me give it a shot anyway. Look, uh, there are a couple of things. So again, it goes down to the choice. So Carrie mentioned different schools of management. And so how, how, how do you make that choice? You go by reputation, right? So you have the Ivy Leagues and we have a very, very good Ivy League school, you know, maybe north, yeah, maybe northeast of us, another 45, 45 miles away, uh, Cornell. Okay, what, what, makes us different, uh, what makes us different from Cornell? Okay, first, when you go to the top business schools, you have to ask yourself who teaches in the classroom. What makes Binghamton different from many others, in fact, most other business schools, is that you have the topmost researchers teaching undergraduates, okay? Why is that important? That is important because it's only the top researchers who can tell you what's not there in the textbook. You need to know what's going on now. Textbooks are two to three to five year old, okay? In many other schools, the top researchers are confined to teaching graduate electives and PhD programs, PhD classes. So the first thing that makes us different is, I mean, when I say us, I mean the School of Management, is you have the best researchers who actually happen to be the best teachers also in the undergraduate classroom. I, for example, teach freshman statistics, meaning in your very second semester, you see me, okay? That's one. The, the second reason that what makes us different is our laser focus on career development. We prepare you for the job market from day one, which means that when you come in as a freshman, we say, hey, where's your resume? And you look at us and say, what resume have you just joined? No, 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 prepare your resume, okay? And then we have experts and professionals who walk you through how to create a good resume, a good professional resume. You may think four years is a long time. Trust me, four years go away just like that. Okay. So a combination of good teaching, a combination of excellent preparation uh, for the marketplace and add on to that mentoring. Those are the things that make us stand apart from other business schools according to me. Thank you so much, Chat. I think this has been great for our attendees and I hope that others who watch this really enjoy it. I know I enjoyed your presentation. Um, we can also feel free to reach out to Professor Chatterjee. Um, I believe your email is S. S. Chatter. S. Chatter. Yeah, S. Chatter at binghamton.edu. At binghamton Perfect. So we'll send this out to all of our attendees. And if you have any further questions, if you want to ask more about the School of Management or about our crazy choices or uh, marketing or anything, you can always feel free to research, reach Professor Chatterjee at that email as well. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I hope you have a great week. And um, thank you again, Professor Chatterjee, for, for taking your time and for doing this with us. We really thank, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.